The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, sponsored by the Illinois Advisor and, uh, and Illinois Soybean Association. I want to thank you for taking some time from your day to listen to that. My name is Dan Davidson, and I am an agronomist and technical consultant to the Illinois Soybean Association. I'll just take a few minutes to cover uh, a few details, and then we'll get launched into the webinar. Uh, today, our speaker is Jason Higley, uh, Agronomy Manager, Regional Grounds of Winfield United. Uh, we want to thank him for coming on board and giving us a webinar on tissue testing. And the title of today's talk, as you can see from your screen, is Optimizing Crop Nutrition with Tissue Testing. Um, uh, Jason uh, lives in Illinois and, and got his PhD under Dr. Fred Beadle at the University of Illinois. Uh, he serves an agronomist and physiologist with Winfield United uh, the last couple of years, uh, and he hails from Iowa. So I want to thank Dr. Dr. Higley for speaking today. Just a few details. Um, the webinar will last, oh, 45 minutes or so. Then we'll take some questions, and at the end, so go ahead and submit them in the in the through the dashboard on the side of your screen. Uh, if you signed up and and fee registered as a CCA and put in your CCA number, you will get a credit on one credit in nutrient management, and that will be posted to the uh, soybean the CCA program in Madison when the program is over. If you're listening to the recording of this event. Uh, you will have to go into your CCA account online and you can self-apply for a credit uh, when you listen to the recording. Now we want to also, before we start, give thank, thank to thank Winfield for helping being a sponsor of this webinar this morning. So without further ado, I'm, uh, Jason, you can take it from here. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning to everyone. I appreciate the, the time that you're spending this morning uh, learning about uh, optimizing crop nutrition with tissue testing. I know that it's a busy time of year. Did we lose Jason? Um, Jason, could you double check and make sure that your audio is on? We're going to review uh, essential nutrients and uh, the elemental prominence concept, and that's essentially uh, looking at those elements that are most important to corn and soybeans at specific Apologize for that, we're having a little technical difficulty. A third, third learning objective is to uh, review crop nutrient uptake and key stages for uh, yield determination in corn and soybean. Uh, we'll dive into tissue testing uh, sampling methods, and then finally we'll look at uh, tissue nutrient ranges and the interpretation of tissue testing results. <clears throat> So to put this in context, uh, I think we all uh, realize that some of the, the national corn yields have been uh, uh, increasing very rapidly in the National Corn Growers Association yield contest. Uh, over the last three years of this contest, we've had yields in excess of 500 bushels per acre. And if we compare that to the national uh, averages during that same time period, uh, we can see that the uh, the yield gap or the difference between the, the National Corn Grower Association uh, yield and then the, the national average uh, is about 350 bushels per acre uh, if we consider that 2016 uh, difference between 521 bushels per acre uh, and 175 bushels per acre. Now each of the national corn grower uh, yield contest winners has their own uh, secret sauce or or recipe for uh, for increasing yields and, and achieving those high yields in the contest. 
uh, but I, I would venture to say that many of those uh, components or ingredients of the, of the high yields uh, are in part due to better plant nutrition. So with that said, uh, I'll argue that crops need greater in-season management to optimize yield and to achieve those, those higher yields. And so specifically, uh, some of the, uh, the aspects that we're going to consider this morning are the, uh, the nutrient requirements and the uptake patterns for, for high yielding corn. Uh, we'll look at sampling methods, uh, tissue sampling specifically, and then we'll look at how those tissue sample results differ uh, across crops and across growth stages and also across different growing seasons uh, as a function of those different environments. So if we think about fertility management in the past, uh, you know, we could argue that traditional agronomy has told us to, uh, you know, first of all, maintain proper soil pH. You know, typically we strive for soil pHs that are uh, as close to neutral as possible to, uh, to ensure availability of, of micronutrients as well as uh, other uh, uh, macronutrients like phosphorus. Uh, we uh, strive to maintain adequate levels <clears throat> of phosphorus and potassium uh, based on uh, soil testing. We apply nitrogen based on some, uh, some yield goal that we're striving for. And in the past, uh, agronomy has typically told us that micronutrients are not needed except in rare circumstances. Uh, you know, for example, on specific crops that have uh, very high micronutrient requirements or on very specific types of uh, soil. So using this traditional uh, agronomy approach, um, we are starting to see that soil test values across the United States are actually starting to decline for some of these key nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, and micronutrients like zinc. Now, the data that I'm showing here uh, is a little bit outdated. This is from 2010, uh, but I know that this, uh, this data or this study has been repeated and the same types of trends are continuing across the United States and Canada as well. Uh, this slide is specifically looking at phosphorus and how soil test values for phosphorus have declined across the United States between 2005 and 2010. On the left side of this figure, uh, for each state, we have uh, the change in soil phosphorus test level uh, between 2005 and 2010. So anywhere where you see a red value with a, a negative sign, this indicates that soil phosphorus levels have decreased uh, between 2005 and 2010. Uh, to go along with that, on the right side, uh, where it says figure three, uh, we have the percentage of samples uh, in each of those states testing below the critical levels for phosphorus uh, for major crops in 2010. And you can see that for Illinois uh, in 2010, 39% uh, of uh, soil samples tested below the critical value uh, for phosphorus. And then in the other Iowa, uh, I states, Iowa and Indiana, uh, we also had very large percentages of uh, soil phosphorus test levels that were low or below the critical level. <clears throat> uh, similar thing for potassium. Uh, again, between 2005 and 2010, uh, for many states in the United States, there was a decline in soil potassium uh, levels in those states. And to go along with that, in, in many of those states, we have uh, a large percentage or proportion of samples that are testing deficient for potassium. And then finally, uh, pulling out an example of a micronutrient, here we have zinc, and this is looking at uh, the percentage of samples in each of these states testing less than one part per million, uh, which is uh, typically considered to be the critical soil test value uh, for zinc. And in 2010, here in Illinois, uh, about a fifth of the samples submitted uh, were deficient for zinc. If we look at Iowa, it was about 40%, and then Indiana was about 42%. So these examples show that uh, traditional agron agronomic management for fertility uh, in regards to macronutrients and micronutrients has been leading to a decline in soil test values. And to make the, the situation even worse, uh, we know that nutrients in the soil uh, do not always equal nutrients in the plant. Uh, for some nutrients like phosphorus, we know that uh, the, the nutrient can become uh, tied up and unavailable in the soil, uh, unavailable to the plant. And in other cases, uh, uh, environmental conditions that lead to uh, uh, poor root development and poor uptake of nutrients can also lead uh, to deficiencies of nutrients within the plant. 
So as we look forward to the, uh, you know, the, the 21st century that we're in, as well as uh, striving for those higher yields that have been shown possible by the, the National Yield Contest, uh, we know that maintaining adequate levels of soil nutrients, uh, you know, primarily those macronutrients like phosphorus and potassium, is only the foundation for yield. Uh, optimizing fertility and achieving those higher yields really takes advantage of in-season uh, tissue testing, which we'll talk more about this morning. Uh, fertilizer technologies, including uh, different sources of fertilizer that make uh, nutrients available throughout the growing season, and then different types of application methods that allow us to, allow us to supply crop nutrients in optimal uh, optimal amounts at key points uh, during growth and development of corn, soybean, and other crops. So our next learning objective this morning is to review uh, essential nutrients and their roles within the plant. Um, essential mineral nutrients for, for plants have been known for, for quite a while. Um, back in 1939, researchers uh, established three different criteria for the role of a plant essential mineral nutrient. And the first one is that a given plant must be unable to complete its life cycle in the absence of the element. So this is, uh, you know, a little bit harder to demonstrate in the soil, but um, can often be shown in a hydroponic situation where nutrients can be uh, completely withheld. And for example, if you completely withhold nitrogen from a plant grown in a hydroponic situation, it, it will not uh, will not survive. And that's the, the same for, for the other essential nutrients as well. The second criteria is that the function of the element must not be replaceable by another element. So this is to say that uh, something like zinc or magnesium is not able to uh, replace the role of nitrogen within the plant and vice versa. And then finally, uh, essential elements must be directly involved in plant metabolism, um, as an example, as a component of a, an enzyme, or must be uh, required for a distinct metabolic step. And if we think about micronutrients, things like zinc, manganese, and copper, we know that many of these micronutrients are involved in enzyme systems and other, other nutrients like nitrogen and potassium are heavily involved in plant metabolism. It's generally regarded that there are 17 essential mineral nutrients, and these uh, mineral nutrients can be classified into different groups based on their role or their responsibility within the plant. So the first group, includes things like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and those are the ones that we get from, from the air, from the atmosphere, as well as uh, from water. And then finally, nitrogen and sulfur. And these are the nutrients that are part of organic carbon-containing compounds, things like enzymes and proteins. The second group includes phosphorus and boron. And these are nutrients that function in energy storage. Uh, phosphorus, for example, is, is used uh, in uh, compounds within the plant that are involved in, in uh, transferring energy between different uh, chemical uh, reactions. And then boron is involved in uh, uh, cell wall biosynthesis and structural integrity. Uh, the third group includes potassium, calcium, magnesium, chlorine, and manganese. And these are nutrients that remain in ionic form. And that's to say that they re remain uh, in the plant in a charged form, uh, either positive uh, or negatively charged. And then finally, group four includes iron, zinc, copper, nickel, and molybdenum. And these are nutrients that function in reduc reduction oxidation reactions. And that's uh, you know, simply to say that they're involved in transferring electrons uh, in different chemical steps and enzyme systems within the plant. Uh, each of these elements or nutrients have different functions within the plant. Uh, this is a, a list of the, the essential elements across the top, starting at nitrogen on the left, uh, ranging over to zinc on the far right. And in the far left column, then we have different general categories uh, of uh, plant physiological uh, processes, uh, including photosynthesis, root development, nitrogen utilization, and plant reproduction. So if you look at this, you can see that some of the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are really heavily involved in many of the different uh, plant physiological processes. As we venture over to the, the right side of the, the graph and we start to look at some of the micronutrients, you can see that although these nutrients are still very important for plant uh, plant growth and development, they have fewer, uh, fewer functions within the plant. 
Iron, for example, is only involved in photosynthesis and protein synthesis. So as we think about these essential micro uh, mineral nutrients, uh, we can then think about elemental prominence. And this will uh, come into play as we think about plant tissue testing and how to interpret the results of plant tissue testing. Uh, simply put, elemental prominence describes the prominent elements or nutrients at a given growth stage of a crop that are needed to ensure optimum growth. The crop demand and sensitivity to each element is unique to each crop. So that's to say that uh, a corn plant is going to require different nutrients and uh, also in different amounts at different growth stages compared to a soybean plant and compared to uh, other crop plants like wheat and alfalfa. And then finally, for each crop, there are specific physiological times of elemental prominence. And we'll, we'll show some examples of that in a moment. So this is an example of elemental prominence for corn uh, taken out of Winfield United's Micronutrient Technical Handbook. And this is looking at five micronutrients, boron, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc and then three secondary macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Uh, in these tables, anywhere where there's a white square indicates that at that growth stage, uh, this crop, corn, will probably not respond to that given nutrient. Anywhere where you see an orange square indicates that for that nutrient at that growth stage, there's a possible response if deficient. And then finally, where you see a green square, it indicates that that crop is highly responsive uh, to that nutrient at that growth stage. Similarly for soybean, uh, we have growth stages broken uh, into general categories of vegetative and reproductive. For the micronutrients, boron, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc, if we're looking at the vegetative growth stage of soybean, uh, it's only iron and manganese where we see highly responsive um, criteria for those nutrients during the vegetative growth stage. Whereas for all five micronutrients, we have a high probability response during the reproductive period when those flowers and pods are beginning to develop. <clears throat> This elemental prominence concept is, is predicated on the idea that as uh, crops grow and develop uh, during the growing season, there are specific or distinct periods in which uh, yield components are established. If we think about a corn crop, we you know first have germination of an emergence of the crop followed by uh, early vegetative growth. At that V5 period, we then start to have ear development uh, when the number of rows around is established in the corn crop and that is driven by specific uh, types of uh, nutrients and specific amounts of nutrients. Uh, following that early period of vegetative growth, we then enter a, a rapid uh, period of, of vegetative growth and stocking elongation and that's uh, also accompanied by rapid uptake of macronutrients and micronutrients and it's during this period uh, that the number of potential kernels per row is being established as those uh, those young ears are growing and expanding within the uh, the growing corn plant. And then finally, at uh, tasseling, silking, and pollination, uh, we also have uh, another distinct set of nutrients that are most likely to be uh, important or limiting to uh, corn growth and development at that growth stage. There's been uh, quite a bit of work done in recent years uh, by various universities uh, to update the, uh, the, the nutrient requirements for both corn and soybean. Uh, most recently, uh, Dr. Bilo's team at the University of Illinois uh, looked at the, the nutrient requirements for both corn and soybean and, and published this, uh, this data in uh, some various journals and articles. Uh, what I'm showing here are the micronutrient requirements for 230 bushel corn uh, for zinc, manganese, boron, iron, and copper. You know, there's two things that I want to point out here. You know, first of all, as the name implies, micronutrients are required in, in small amounts, in small amounts that are measured in ounces per acre as opposed to pounds or tons per acre. 
If we look at these uh, five micronutrients, the requirements for this 230 bushel uh, per acre corn crop range from only 1.2 ounces per acre for boron uh, to nearly 19 ounces per acre for iron. The other thing that I want to point out here is if, if we look at the amount removed with the grain and then the corresponding percentage of the total removed with the grain, you can see that generally speaking, most of these micronutrients have very low requirements in the grain itself. Um, with the exception of zinc, where 62% of the zinc in the plant is actually found in the grain at harvest, most of the micronutrients, manganese, boron, iron, and copper, are primarily found in the leaf or vegetative tissue. And as a result of that, that provides us with an opportunity to uh, detect these nutrients in the plant through tissue testing and then apply foliar nutrients uh, to, to the foliage to uh, rectify any deficiencies that are detected by the, the tissue testing method. I'm going to briefly review the uptake and partitioning patterns for both corn and soybean for zinc, manganese, and boron, uh, since these will be three of the micronutrients that'll be key uh, or central to our discussion here this morning. <clears throat> Uh, this is the data from uh, Dr. Bilo's team at the University of Illinois for uh, the 230 bushel per acre corn crop, looking at the uptake and partitioning of zinc uh, between the leaves, which would be the dark green um, section of the graph, the stalks and the leaf sheaths, which would be the, the yellowish brown uh, part of the graph, the tassel, cob, and husk leaves, which would be the red, and then the green, which would be the blue. <clears throat> uh, this information shows that, you know, in the leaf, zinc is primarily taken up between about V4 and V14 in the corn crop. As we think about plant tissue testing, our general recommendation is to start um, tissue testing in the leaves uh, between uh, V4 and V6. And you can see that that coincides quite well uh, with the beginning of accumulation of these micronutrients in the leaf tissue. <laughs> Uh, following V14, uh, there's there's really no additional accumulation of zinc in the leaf, and most of the, the zinc <clears throat> that's being taken up by gr the grain uh, later in the growing season either comes from uh, remobilization from the stalk and leaf sheaths or directly from uh, soil uptake of zinc later in the growing season. Uh, in contrast, if we look at the uptake and partitioning of manganese for a 230 bushel per acre corn crop, uh, you can see that uh, a much larger percentage of the manganese in the plant is actually found in the leaf. Uh, at maturity, uh, over 50% of the manganese in the plant is found in the, the leaves of the corn plant. And you'll also note that manganese uptake in the leaf uh, occurs um, across the entire growing season. You know, again, um, you know, really starting to ramp up around B4, B5, but that uptake of manganese in the leaf uh, continues all the way through uh, physiological maturity in the corn crop. And as a result of that, if we refer back to our elemental prominence concept, uh, manganese continues to be uh, highly responsive uh, in the corn crop, even late in the growing season, uh, if it's deficient in the leaf. And then finally, boron uptake and partitioning for a 230 uh, per acre bushel corn crop uh, shows that, uh, again, there's a rapid uptake of foliar boron uh, starting around V4, V5. Uh, this peaks around V14. And then we start to see a little bit of remobilization uh, from that leaf boron around uh, R1 as that plant is uh, starting to uh, enter uh, tasseling and pollination. Uh, we know that we know that boron is an important uh, el element or nutrient for reproduction in both corn and soybean. It's involved in uh, uh, pollen vi viability as well as the reproductive success of developing kernels or, or pods in the case of soybean. Uh, so oftentimes the recommendation is to apply a uh, foliar boron uh, immediately ahead of uh, tasseling or pollination to support that remobilization from boron uh, from the leaf into the developing reproductive tissues. So in the case of soybean, uh, you know, flowering, vegetative growth, and pod development have uh, you know, some, some heavy overlap. Uh, across the duration of the growing season in contrast to a corn crop where you have very distinct um, uh, periods of, of growth and development where vegetative uh, development occurs and followed by reproductive development. 
you know, similar to what we showed for the corn crop, the micronutrient requirements for a 60 bushel per acre soybean crop are shown here, again, for zinc, manganese, boron, iron, and copper. The maximum amount in ounces per acre for these five micronutrients ranges from only 0.9 ounces per acre in the case of copper uh, to as much as 12.1 ounces per acre for iron. <coughs> Uh, again, um, you know, like the corn crop, most of the micronutrients are primarily found in the leaves. If we look over at this column that is labeled harvest index, this describes the percentage of the total amount of nutrient found in the grain at harvest. So in the case of zinc, for the soybean crop, only 44% is found in the grain, and the other 56% is found in the, the vegetative part of the plant. Uh, if we look at, at zinc uptake and partitioning for a 60 bushel per acre soybean crop, uh, we see that, uh, again, about 40% of the, the total zinc in the plant at uh, harvest is found in the leaves. And this zinc uptake in the foliage or the leaf uh, portion of the plant occurs across the entire duration of the growing season, uh, which is, again, another indication that uh, we can test this foliage for uh, nutrient deficiencies at different growth stages during the growing season and then apply a, bowl, a foliar micronutrient zinc source uh, to address any deficiencies that we find. <clears throat> uh, similar thing for manganese, again, about 50% of the total manganese is found in the leaves, and this uptake occurs across the duration of the growing season. And then finally, for boron uptake and partitioning for the 60 bushel per acre soybean crop, uh, we see that uptake of boron in the leaves uh, really peaks around the, the R5 growth stage and then stays relatively uh, relatively constant. Uh, but we do know that boron is, again, important for supporting reproductive development in soybean, uh, you know, primarily uh, flower initiation and uh, pollination. And so boron applied uh, early, uh, early in the growing season or around flowering is most likely to uh, support that, that reproductive process. All right, so that's that's a little bit of uh, background on the nutrients and and uh, why they're important, uh, the amounts that they're taken up in, and and how they're partitioned among the plant. And now we're going to shift our focus into uh, understanding tissue testing. Uh, first of all, how it's done, uh, how to submit a sample, uh, how to interpret the results, and then look at some tissue testing trends uh, for both corn and soybean here in Illinois across the last uh, two growing seasons. <coughs> So uh, plant tissue testing is, is not a new tool. It's been around for, for a number of years and it's been uh, used widely in, in other crops. Uh, for example, in potatoes, uh, a similar type of approach known as uh, uh, petiole testing is used uh, to understand the, the nutrients found in the sap of the potato plant. And with that data, potato growers can, can make in-season management decisions to address any nutrient deficiencies within their potato crop. Uh, tissue testing. <clears throat> within Winfield United, uh, it falls under the uh, the umbrella of the NutriSolutions 360 program. And what this is, is a simple, effective tool for understanding crop nutrient needs. Uh, it measures nutrient levels in the plant throughout the growing season, uh, whereas soil tests only measure nutrients at one point in time, you know, either in the spring or in the fall, depending on when you collect the soil test. And uh, plant tissue tests also uh, you know, provide some insight into what actually makes it into the plant as opposed to the potential nutrition found in the soil. <clears throat> uh, the insights from tissue testing uh, allow us to uh, make quick nutrient adjust adjustments before visual symptoms appear uh, to protect yield. Uh, if you're starting to see you know, severe visual de uh, deficiency symptoms in the field, you know, that may be an indication that yield potential has already been, a lot, uh, already been lost and may not be able to be recovered within that growing season. Uh, this program started uh, several years ago, and uh, as of current, more than 400,000 samples have been submitted to, uh, to the NutriSolutions 360 tissue program, uh, which is, allows us to uh, you know, mine our database to look at some of the trends that we're going to show today. So first of all, how to tissue sample. Uh, we'll go through several different uh, steps here. The first one being crop specific. And the idea here is that different crops require different sampling times for optimal results. <clears throat> and this is somewhat based on the, the growth and development differences between corn, soybean, and other crops. 
and the growth stages that are key to establishing yield uh, components in those different crops. To go along with that, the second step is to choose optimal leaves uh, to submit to the laboratory. Uh, as an example, if we look at corn, if we're sampling a vegetative plant between V4 and V12, uh, the part or the optimal leaf to sample is the uppermost collared leaf uh, on the plant. We say the uppermost collared leaf because this is the, the leaf that is uh, you know, fully, fully developed um, and will provide the, the best snapshot of the nutrient status of the plant at that specific growth stage. If we shift to the reproductive uh, stages of the corn plant between R1 and R4, we're looking at the ear leaf because we know that the ear leaf is the leaf that um, contributes most, um, most of the photosynthesis and sugars and metabolism uh, that uh, ultimately contribute to the grain filling and ear development within the corn plant. As far as the, the sample size or the number of plants to sample, uh, we typically recommend 30 to 35 and that allows us to uh, provide enough leaf tissue to the laboratory uh, so that it can be dried, digested, and analyzed for the nutrients that we're interested in. Uh, similarly for soybean, we have a couple of different um, sampling windows. We have a early vegetative sampling window, V3 to V5. And then the second sampling window is uh, between R1 and R4 when those flowers and uh, pods are beginning to develop within the soybean crop. At both of these sampling windows, the part of the plant to sample is the uppermost fully open mature trifoliate leaf without the, the petiole or the, you know, the, the slender stem that connects the, the actual leaf, uh, leaf blades to the, the main stem or branch of the soybean plant. The third step is to use healthy tissue. So this would, uh, you know, recommend avoiding uh, disease tissue or insect uh, insect damage tissue. You know, we're looking for leaves that are uh, functioning at their, their peak performance, again, so that we can get a snapshot of the, the true nutrient status of the plant at that particular time of the growing season. Uh, collect a sufficient amount of plant material. This comes back to, you know, collecting 30 to 35 uh, plants, uh, but typically the recommendation is to collect about a, a softball sized uh, mass of, of leaf material. Uh, this will be an adequate amount of leaf material for the laboratory to analyze once uh, once the leaves are dried and, and digested uh, as, as preparation for the actual analysis of the, the nutrients. Fifth step is to randomize the plant selection process. So I do recommend you know, thinking carefully about the, the parts of the field that you uh, that you sample. Uh, it may be wise to select um, you know, plants from a good part of the field as well as a more challenged part of the field. Uh, but when you go into those parts of the field, you know, don't look for the worst plants or don't look for the best plants. You know, take uh, a random selection of representative plants within those different parts of the field. And then finally, the sixth step is to avoid contamination. And this is really, um, you know, trying to avoid any type of soil that may be present, uh, soil or dust that may be present on the leaf surface because um, both of these factors can affect, uh, affect the, the amount of nutrients analyzed and detected on, on that, uh, that leaf tissue sample. If the leaves are dusty or dirty, uh, you recommend you know, washing those uh, with some water and, and drying them before putting them in the package and sending them off to the laboratory. <clears throat> so once you've sent your samples into the laboratory, uh, you'll get something back that looks um, you know, potentially similar to this. This is an example from um, the NutriSolutions 360 program, uh, but any laboratory that provides uh, plant tissue uh, tissue testing, it would have a, a similar type of report that re you know, reports the, the percentage or the parts per million uh, levels of the nutrients that have been anal analyzed, as well as an indication of whether those nutrients are excessive, uh, responsive, adequate, or deficient within that plant tissue. And in many cases, the laboratory will also provide a recommendation on what can be, do, uh, what can be done uh, to address any nutrient deficiencies uh, um, found within, within the plant at that particular uh, time of the season. <clears throat> so this is an example of a uh, sample that was collected from soybeans at the R3 growth stage near Champaign, Illinois uh, this past growing season. 
Um, so this was collected in uh, early August, analyzed for nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, calcium, zinc, boron, manganese, and copper. For each of these nutrients, we have the, the amount present within the, the leaf at that uh, point in the growing season. So for example, nitrogen, uh, the, the amount was 6.47%. If we look at a micronutrient, because the, the levels are, are much lower for a micronutrient compared to a macronutrient, they're reported in parts per million, uh, zinc being 41 parts per million in this particular sample. <clears throat> for some of the nutrients, we have an indication that it was actually excessive. Others were you know, deficient, but in the responsive range, and in other cases, they were actually uh, adequate or sufficient for the plant at that particular growing stage. So as you look at these tissue sampling reports, you'll see some, some uh, terms like deficient, responsive, uh, sufficient, and excessive. So I just want to briefly go through what those uh, defini definitions actually mean. Uh, first of all, starting at the low end of the range, uh, deficient is the zone where you can expect visual deficiency symptoms. So this is a plant where uh, the nutrient is limiting and it's so limiting that you can actually see some uh, some visual deficiency symptoms, whether it be uh, necrosis uh, or chlorosis, depending on the, the exact nutrient that is deficient. Uh, depending on the growth stage, uh, yield reduction may have already occurred. Um, you can uh, apply fertilizer or a nutrient to halt further decline, uh, but that lost yield will probably not be recovered um, at this point in the growing season. As we move up uh, in the range, the responsive uh, portion of the range or low portion of the range is the part of the sufficiency zone where yield reduction is expected, uh, but it's not so, uh, so bad that visual deficiency symptoms uh, have presented themselves. Adequate is the target zone. Uh, the goal of uh, fertilizer or uh, plant nutrient management is to uh, manage fertilizer applications to obtain the middle of this range. And then finally, the excessive range indicates a severe imbalance that may lead to toxicity and death of the plant. So uh, as an example of where these, these values and these different uh, definitions come from, uh, many of the laboratories in the United States that provide uh, tissue testing services uh, refer to uh, the Plant Analysis Handbook written by Mills and Jones uh, as, a, as a resource to uh, determine um, you know, where these different, uh, different categories or ranges are um, established for different crops at different growth stages. <laughs> Uh, the example that I showed here is for zinc for corn, and you can see that um, there are actually different uh, different values for deficient, responsive, adequate, and excessive based on the growth stage. So if we're early in the growing season, V1 to V5, when we have a small vegetative plant, the the numbers are actually actually higher, indicating a higher requirement for zinc uh, early in the growing season. And for corn, we know that you know even though the the total amount of zinc taken up early in the growing season is small, that's also the time of the year where uh, the corn plant is most responsive to zinc, uh, in part due to the the role that zinc plays in early root development of the corn crop. As we go later into the growing season, the values decline, you know, indicating that um, you know it takes a you know smaller smaller number for the plant to be uh, to be deficient, uh, indicating less uh, less zinc is required by the corn crop later in the growing season. So finally, we're going to wrap up looking at some of the uh, tissue testing trends for Illinois over the last two growing seasons, 2015 and 2016, for both corn and soybean. Uh, we'll first look at corn um, and We'll, we'll first look at corn uh, samples collected between the seven and nine leaf growth stages in 2015. So as we look at these different charts for corn, uh, they're arranged uh, in order of the nutrients that were most uh, deficient plus responsive. So we combined uh, the, the samples that were both uh, highly deficient and then those samples that were uh, you know, deficient but still responsive to, to fertilizer, uh, fertilizer application. 
uh, boron being the most deficient and resp plus responsive, and then copper being the least deficient plus responsive. <clears throat> Uh, in 2015, which of course was a, uh, a wet year in Illinois, at least early on, uh, boron, potassium, zinc, and mangan manganese were the top four nutrients uh, that were most uh, deficient in, in the corn crop in Illinois in 2015. Uh, this makes some sense for boron, which is a, a negatively charged nutrient. So in a wet year, uh, boron has the potential to leach, much like uh, nitrogen does uh, in the soil. <laughs> If we switch to 2016, same same growth stages between V7 and V9, you know, again uh, we see that some of the nutrients are uh, the same between years, but their their um, their order has changed somewhat, and we also have some some other nutrients showing up as being deficient. The the number one nutrient that was deficient in 2016 uh, between V7 and V9 was actually zinc. Uh, manganese was uh, the second most deficient nutrient in 2016 followed by nitrogen and potassium. And then you can see that boron, even though uh, you know, still a large portion of the samples are deficient, is fifth in comparison to being first in, in 2015. <clears throat> if we switch to lower, uh, later in the growing season, um, specifically at R1, the R1 growth stage or silk emergence in corn, in 2015, you can see that the top four nutrients that are deficient in corn in Illinois at R1 in 2015 are sulfur, potassium, magnesium, and manganese. Sulfur and potassium, be, uh, potassium being the, the top nutrients that are deficient in corn at this particular growth stage. <clears throat> uh, similarly, in 2016 at R1 growth stage, you can see that again, potassium and sulfur are the the number one and number two nutrients that are deficient in corn at this growth stage, and then manganese and zinc are the third and fourth most deficient nutrients in corn at these particular <coughs> particular growth stages. Uh, we'll now look at soybeans, and the, the first data that I show you here is uh, a national national look at soybean nutrient deficiency trends. Uh, in the NutriSolutions 360 program across four different years, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. Uh, specifically looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, manganese, copper, and zinc. Uh, across these four different growing seasons across the United States, um, you know, looking at a database of uh, over 37,000 tissue samples, uh, it was actually potassium that was the number one nutrient deficient in soybean uh, across the United States in, in each of these four years. And if we look at uh, micronutrients, manganese and copper uh, were the, the two nutrients most, uh, two micronutrients most commonly deficient or limiting in soybean uh, in the United States. If we bring this closer to home uh, for Illinois and soybean grown in Illinois over the last uh, two growing seasons, I've uh, actually divided the data by uh, geographic regions. So we'll first look at north uh, areas north of Interstate 70, and then we'll uh, look at areas south of Interstate 70 in the second slide. And the reason for dividing the data Interstate 70 is that this is roughly the transition between the, the high organic matter, uh, you know, the darker soils of northern Illinois, uh, to the lighter, uh, heavier clay soils of, uh, of southern Illinois. On the left side of the slide, we have vegetative samples collected between V1 and V8. And then finally on the right, we have samples uh, from the reproductive period collected between R1 and R7. And you can see that you know, regardless of the, of the growing stage, vegetative versus reproductive, it's, uh, it's actually manganese that is the most commonly deficient or limiting nutrient in soybean in Illinois, at least north of Interstate 70. Uh, like the national data, potassium is also uh, commonly deficient or limiting in soybean. And then as we go later into the growing season for soybean here in Illinois, we start to see other nutrient deficiencies like copper, magnesium, and possibly sulfur as well. Uh, this slide looks at the, the number or the uh, samples from south of Interstate 70 in Illinois, again, divided between vegetative and reproductive growth stages. 
I would caution you that uh, a smaller number of samples uh, contributed to this database for south of Interstate 70. Uh, but again, you can see that uh, particularly uh, during the reproductive period of soybean, it's manganese that's uh, deficient in soybean in southern Illinois. Um, you know, 100% of the time in 2015. 85 percent of the time in 2016 and the potassium also very limiting and deficient uh, you know particularly um, early in the growing season between v1 and v8 so as we wrap up here i want to leave you with a couple of examples of, of how uh, tissue sampling and and uh, nutrient application actually come together uh, to be able to enable um, you know, more, more effective or more intelligent uh, applications of, of nutrients like uh, uh, manganese or other micronutrients. Uh, this was a study that was done in 2016 in Winfield United's answer plot system, uh, specifically at three locations in Indiana, where, uh, you know, first of all, tissue samples were collected. And for these uh, different locations, um, we have tissue samples, uh, manganese levels that range from 53 parts per million uh, to as much as 85 per, parts per million. Uh, for these first two locations, Farmersburg and DeMott, Indiana, the level of manganese present in the tissue would indicate that these samples are responsive to uh, an application of a manganese-containing fertilizer source. Uh, whereas the sample collected at Pershing would indicate that that sample or that uh, location was actually adequate for uh, for manganese in the, the soybean leaves at that that uh, time of the growing season. If uh, ultra uh, maxin manganese was applied to these different locations, uh, the increase in yield ranged from 9.7 bushels per acre at the most responsive location to only one bushel per acre at the adequate location. So this is data that would suggest that you know, a relatively inexpensive tissue sample uh, can be used uh, as a tool to decide whether or not to make a more expensive or more costly uh, fertilizer application, um, you know, like this one uh, where manganese was applied uh, to, the, to the foliage of the soybean crop. You know, in addition to soybean, um, soybeans, micronutrient applications in corn have also been seen to be very effective. Uh, this is an example uh, looking at a season-long uh, approach to micronutrient uh, management in, in a corn crop. You know, we don't have the, the exact yields here, but we have uh, you know, some, some examples of ears collected from these different treatments showing the, the differences in tip fill-out for the three treatments. On the far left, we have an untreated, so there would be no additional micronutrients applied to this uh, particular treatment. In the middle, we have a fertilizer source containing zinc, manganese, and boron applied at the V5 growth stage uh, to address some of those early season nutrient needs in corn, as well as to support uh, early ear development. And then finally, on the far right, we have the combination of that early season application of zinc, manganese, and boron, uh, followed by an additional application of boron at VT, uh, again, to support uh, reproductive de uh, development in the corn crop. Uh, due to the the role that boron plays in in uh, ear growth and pollen viability. Uh, with that, I appreciate your time uh, time this morning. Again, I know that's a busy time of year, a lot going on. But uh, in a short few short weeks, um, the crop will be out of the ground, and we'll be starting to focus on um, monitoring the crop and making in season management decisions, particularly around nutrition, whether that's a citrus application. Uh, or a foliar application of uh, micronutrients, and tissue sampling, tissue testing can be a can be a tool to help guide us in understanding the the end season uh, nutrient um, uptake and deficiencies that are present in our crop, and then allow us to make uh, those those nutrient applications to to address any uh, any deficiencies that are found at those different times. Uh, with that, um, on the slide I have my contact information, phone number, and email. So I encourage you to, uh, to contact me if you have any specific questions. And uh, I think we also have some time for, for questions here in the next, uh, next few minutes before we wrap up at 11. Okay, okay, Jason, thank you very much. Very, very good presentation. I, I have a, uh, some questions here to ask you. This, go back to, uh, I'm not, you don't have to go back to the slide, but you talked about this new classification of nutrients by Mengel and this other author back in the turn of this decade, turn of the century. And I've never seen that before. 
Does that 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 new classification and and in how you looked at prominence does that kind of change how we look at primary, secondary, and micronutrients? Has that changed that classification at all? No, I, I don't think it does. You know, if we think about primary and secondary macronutrients as well as micronutrients, it's it's really um, you know a reflection of the the amounts uh, that those nutrients are, are required in. You know, you know, nitrogen and potassium example for a corn crop are you know, required in levels you know on the level or order of you know two or three hundred pounds per acre, whereas a micronutrient again is is uh, you know applied at um, you know an ounce per acre or a few ounces per acre. So, you know, all these nutrients are essential and, and required by the plant, but, um, you know, are required in different amounts and, and different, uh, you know, different points during the growing season. And we're, as we're, you know, continuing to learn more about plant nutrition, we're, we're realizing more and more that these nutrients, you know, work together and interact and, you know, that, you know, to, to really achieve some of these higher yields that, that growers have been experiencing, it, it's, it's, you know, maybe not so much about, the amounts it's about the timing and, and really getting the balance right between uh, the, the the micronutrients and the macronutrients okay so uh, have, we have a question here and this came in have you ground truth adding foliar nutrients in in yield gains and let me before you answer the question and i i was actually thinking about this so you look at a field you've got a lot of variability across that field. you, know, you could do a soil test you've got soil type differences You've got tissue, uh, soil test differences all across the field, and you know, grid sampling picks that up. So in this with tissue testing in that where you kind of do it kind of general, you don't do it on a grid pattern, uh, how effective is tissue testing in that regard and making a blanket micronutrient or a nutrient application foliarly? How effective is that? And have you, have you ever, Going back to the question, have you ever ground truthed any of that uh, across the field because of that variability? No, not 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 specifically. You know, I think in part just kind of goes back to those last examples I showed with the the manganese application in Indiana, and you know, showing the relationship between the the tissue level and the the response to the you know the the manganese, which you know there seemed to be a nice you know, correlation between the the tissue level and the potential for response to the uh, to the nutrient. You know, in terms of the variability across the field, you know that that certainly does exist. And you know, as I think about you know sampling approaches and, and where to collect those samples, you know, in in the field, you know, I think it, it does make some sense to uh, you know maybe use some additional tools to understand you know where that variability is in the field. You know, whether that's a um, you know a soil. Uh, you know, soil test values that you have at your disposal, or perhaps you know maybe you're using uh, aerial imagery, whether that's um, you know coming from a plane or a satellite or a drone, you know to maybe understand where some of those different uh, you know parts of the field are at, or where those different management zones are at, and then go in and, and collect samples in those different uh, uh, you know different regions, uh, because you know, in effect what you may find is that in the good part of the field, um, you know the nutrient levels within the plant are, are adequate, and you know there's no you know, no additional action needed, but um, you, you may find that in those those uh, more challenged or uh, poorly performing parts of the field, you know, there is in fact a nutrient deficiency that you can then, um, you know, make plans to address either within that growing season using uh, foliar uh, foliar application, or or maybe uh, maybe you make a plan to address that with some type of variable rate or prescri uh, prescriptive application of a soil uh, soil fertilizer source for the the following growing seasons. So if you have a field where you talk about clay knob versus a, a lowland area where soil accumulation is darker, uh, more organic matter, more accumulation of nutrients, how would you would you would you sample each separately? But how then would you write a recommendation? Yeah. Yes. You know, I think that would be a good good approach to sample those separately. Uh, because we know that you know soil with a little bit higher organic matters, you know, potentially going to have a little bit different um, you know, availability of of these nutrients to the plant compared to a, a clay knob, and uh, you know that's that's also going to be reflected probably in the the yield potential of those those different parts of the field as, as well. You know, in terms of of making a recommendation, you know, I think that really comes down to 
you know your your local situation and and you know what you uh, you know what you have at your disposal as far as uh, you know application equipment and, and making recommendations. You know if you have the potential to you know to go in and you know really target those those more um, you know more deficient or challenged areas and you know maybe that's maybe that's a good approach. But um, you know certainly there's no um, you know there's no reason why you can't make a a blanket application across the entire field. You know just with the you know the expectation or the realization that you know your your greater return on investment is probably going to come from the more deficient parts of the field compared to those those areas that were were more sufficient or uh, had more nutrients available to to the plant during the growing season. Okay. Okay. Uh, so a couple of questions you sort of answered them. You know about how frequently do you test and you put that up there. You had a couple of testing periods for. One in soybeans that we talked about, you need like a softball, softball size mass of tissue for analysis. Now, when you listen to Randy Dowdy speak now, he talks about going out there every Monday, sampling every week. You know, we're most aware of a vegetative sample and a reproductive sample timing, and our, and our thinking flows along those lines, but now. He's telling people you should sample every week, and we have farmers going to be sampling every week just to try to understand this. What do you think about that? Is more better? Well, I, I think I think Randy's approach is is good, and you know certainly he's got a different uh, different goal or a different expectation in mind for how he's going to use those samples uh, to address nutrient deficiencies deficiencies during the growing season. Um, you know, for those on the line that um, you know, maybe aren't familiar with uh, Randy Dowdy's approach, um, you know, I think he began sampling his corn crop around 350 growing degree units, which is around around that V4 growth stage, and then he you know follows up uh, weekly with another tissue sample to, to understand where his crop is at, and then uh, you know apply nutrients as required. You know, I think uh, you know for the most part, most uh, you know most growers are not. Uh, you're not going to follow that level of intensity of, of sampling and, and you know, follow up nutrient applications. Um, and you know, part of the reason that the, the sampling stages that, that I showed have been selected are, you know, first of all, for the importance that those growth stages have on yield, uh, but also that those growth stages tend to coincide with other uh, other types of applications that we're making um, in the field at those those times. So, for example. You're around that, uh, you know, that V4, V5 growth stage in corn. You know, we may be uh, thinking about post herbicide applications or something like that. So, you know, we have the app the uh, the opportunity to to piggyback a, a micronutrient along with uh, the herbicide. Um, you know, similarly with uh, soybeans, the R1 to R3 growth stage. You know, it's important. Um, you know, for determining yield, but also you know, around that growth stage, we're also thinking about uh, insecticides and fungicides. Um, where we again have an opportunity to, to piggyback a nutrient if, if it's needed. So part of the, uh, when they talk about sufficiency levels in tissue testing today, I mean we're using everybody uses sort of a certain categories that for deficient sufficient excess that we're all aware of been around for a while, a couple decades. But are those numbers are they do those numbers, those thresholds how do they apply to 500 bushel corn and 150 bushel soybean? Are they accurate? Are they are they 20 percent? Are they low by 20 percent? Any have you any thinking on that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I know that's a question that again Randy Dowdy has, has raised in some of his recent uh, recent presentations. And you know, I, I think first of all, we just don't have enough uh, you know data or experience with 500 bushel corn to be able to to make that determination. Um, but my my gut feeling is that you know if we think about plants you know there's certainly a a range of nutrients that can be found in the leaves and you know that's um, you know you know provides us with the ability to do tissue sampling and, and to measure those levels uh, but at the same time you know plants have mechanisms for um, you know tightly regulating or controlling those those levels of nutrients in the plant so I don't know that it's a, a matter that a 500 bushel per acre corn crop needs you know 20 percent you know, higher concentration of a nutrient in the leaf. Um, you know, I think it maybe comes down to the approach that Randy Dowdy has used, and and you know, a more rigorous tissue sampling and applying or spoon feeding nutrients you know, across the you know duration of the growing season, whether that's uh, you know weekly or you know every couple of weeks or monthly or whatever it might be, so that that plant is not deficient in a nutrient uh, 
at any given point during during the season. Well, I think that's some, that's some, uh, thanks for that comment, Jason. I think over the next couple of years, Mr. Dowdy's got us thinking about that. Mm-hmm. We can see in the levels that I think this will sort itself out, and maybe what you say is correct. Oh. Whoa. Excuse me, I've got a siren across from my house. So, hey, uh, one other question I want to ask. What is the, you know, when you, the gap between when we see symptoms and deficiency? The, you know, when you see when you see symptoms in a plant, and you can have deficiencies in uh, a bit that imp- impacts metabolism, but not have seeing these symptoms. When you see symptoms, your deficiencies are probably greater than you would have thought. I, I'm just wondering if, if there's any kind of, when you finally see symptoms, is there any kind of rule of thumb how far how far you've dropped below that deficiency level? No, I, I don't know that there's a general rule of thumb, but um, you know, I think you've you brought up another good point that you know I've, I've talked about the responsive. Uh, responsive range, and that really gets back to um, the hidden hunger concept that, that some of you may have uh, heard of, or maybe used that term before. And it's, you know, it's referring to that 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 zone or that region within the plant where uh, you know the nutrient deficiency isn't visual, but yet there's there's a you know an, an impact on the metabolism of the plant or a, or a hidden hunger that that does impact um, you know the final yield. So you know. One of the key strengths of tissue testing is being able to detect that hidden hunger, so that um, you know, we can you know, hopefully recover or achieve some of those those bushels that would otherwise be lost. Well, okay, we've we've reached our time limit here. Uh, again, we want to thank you, Jason, for for doing a really good job today, and it made me think about a few things and actually learn a few things. So, thank you very much. Uh, and again. If you were a CCA that participated today and signed up and submitted your number, uh, you'll get one CEU in nutrient management for participating. And if you are listening to this recording, you have to go back online and to your CCA account, and you can self-apply for a credit for this one webinar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the ILSO Advisor uh, within a few days. Again, on behalf of the uh, Illinois Soybean Association, Illinois, the uh, Illinois Advisor website, and also Winfield for being a sponsor, we want to thank you for coming on uh, today and listening, and let's hope we have uh, get the planting season all finished and done and have a good growing season. Again, thank you, Jason, and thank you, everyone, and the webinar is now done.